All right, let's see what happens. All right, my microphone's on, so at least that's working. All right, so let's say good morning again. Good morning, church. Good morning. All right, it's good to have you with us. We're going to do something a little bit different today. I have some fun slides that are going to start our message, but the first slide here is being the church. We're to be, how many of you know, in the world, but not of the world, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at Romans chapter 12 for a moment, verses 1 through 2, and I'm just going to take this moment to, to emphasize something that, that is constant around here. Uh, Stephen's been in this for a long time on his messages. I always refer back to this. Let me read these two verses, make my statement about it, and then move into the theme today. This is what I'm going to tell you up front. There's not going to be an altar call in the traditional sense, like in response to the word. It's not going to be an emotional word that tugs at your heart. It's going to be truth that tells us some differences. Because how many of you know there are two fields that we're supposed to invest in? As, as, as followers of Jesus, there are two fields. There's the vineyard, right? And this is the vineyard right here. The church is the vineyard. But there's also the harvest field. And we're going to take some moments to separate what the differences are between the vineyard and the harvest field and why the church gets so confused about what our role is. But here's where it starts. Because a bit of the world creeps into the church. We get confused in the church. And then when we go out into the world, we're bringing the world with us back to the world and they don't know who Jesus is and know how to separate this and they don't see any difference from us in them and so they're not attracted to the Jesus that we know because we are in the world and of the world and so the church the vineyard is supposed to be in the world the harvest field but not of the world we're not supposed to look like the world Romans 12 1 and 2 says I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable to God which is your reasonable service and do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Everyone say, do not be conformed. Do not be conformed. Yeah, that convinced me as much as I think the church really believes it. Let's say it again. Do not be conformed. Do not be conformed. See, the problem with a lot of us is that we're so accustomed to being conformed, we can't say this a whole lot with conviction. Right? But the Bible's clear. Do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed. And what say be transformed? Be transformed. You know what transformed means, right? You ever seen the Transformer movies? Great movies, right? These these cars and these vehicles, trucks and all this stuff. And, and they, they become something other than that. They become these battle bots, if you will, <coughs> fighting evil. Right. Mm -hmm. We need to and we need to change. We need <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me, choking on the cracker. <laughs> we need to be transformed, right? We can't stay the same as we were in the world before we knew Jesus. When we come into the vineyard, there's supposed to be a transformation that happens within us. I so believe in this verse that this is what I say, and I say it, and you've heard me say it, and I'm going to say it again, and I can prove it by Scripture, but it's a different message, so I'm not going to take the time today. Everybody that had an encounter with Jesus was changed. Everybody. And so if we're not changed, you might have a knowledge about Jesus, but if you're not transformed, I don't even know that you're saved. I don't care what you say, because you judge a tree by its fruit. And if there is no transformation, you have to wonder about salvation. Because even the people that encountered Jesus that didn't get saved, they were changed. And I'm not going to take the time to go there, but you can see it in Scripture. It's consistent. It's constant. It's continual. And the Lord is constant in His continual call for us to be changed. Like when we fall in love with Jesus, and I talked about this one day this week, right? When we fall in love with Jesus and we can't get enough, we go to church, and it doesn't matter which church. We want Bible study. We want prayer. We want fellowship. We want to be in worship. We want all of that. And so when you first fell in love with Jesus, you just couldn't get enough. And so you are out in the presence of God everywhere and anywhere. And it just because that's what, But then what happens is a bit of the world creeps in. And you start to slide away from that love. So Jesus calls us back, now as believers, to our first love. He goes, you need to change again. 
Don't satisfy yourself with your current condition when you're supposed to be living like this. This is what it means here. Paul says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Listen, I know when it's 10 degrees out with a windshield factor of minus 5 and it's dark at night, it's really inconvenient to get all dressed and put on the coat and come out midweek and, you know, be in a church that might not be heated all the way up because, you know, it's, it, we just don't have enough time to get the building up to time. I know all of that stuff, but it's a sacrifice. Right? There's so many places that we're so unwilling to pay the price that we're just settling for the things of the world. And we begin to look like the world. What do you mean you don't love Jesus like you used to love? Well, I do. No, you don't. You don't go to church. You don't go to Bible study. You don't go to prayer. You don't come to worship, etc., etc., etc. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. How many of you know this expression bothers me and I hear it a lot? You guys hear it a lot. I'm sure you might even use it. Oh, I'm with you in spirit. No, you're not. You're where you're at, watching whatever TV show, American Idol, or whatever you're doing. Don't tell me you're with me in spirit when you're involving yourself in something of the world. You're not. You're just not. And so we get this whole mindset because it becomes a decision to present your body. It's a decision. That's not a spiritual thing. I know that, like I said, there's nothing going to be emotional today. This is just going to be truth. Is that all right? That's See, you present your body by a choice you make. When it's 10 degrees and it's dark out and it's a negative wind chill of five, I mean, a, a, a wind chill of negative five and you don't want it because, oh man, just, man, I'm so happy for the time that we're moving into. Yes. But you know what? We get distractions in the summer too. The mountains or the beach or the, you know, Whatever our calling. And we use those things as our excuses as to not be in that place that we used to be at when we fell in love with Jesus. We let the world creep in. And then we use excuses because we're good at it. My, my good friend over here is the first one that introduced me to this phrase. Excuses are just reasons wrapped in a lie. We use excuses as to why we can't, or why we more particularly won't. Because we make decisions, because if it's important enough to us, we'll find a way regardless of how hard it is. How do I know that? Because we can't afford those $125 tickets to go to a football game, but if it's a, it's a, if it's a game you want to go see because it's against the robbery, you'll find 125 bucks, period. You'll do it, and you'll sit, as Deb and I did a number of years ago, through a game where it was the coldest in Gillette Stadium's history, and we were down 24 to 3 at halftime, and sitting in the nosebleed section of Gillette Stadium where the wind whistled right by you, and you could literally feel it going through you. And I wasn't leaving. And I was with other folks, three other people. The guy that was with me was so cold, he was up in the concourse the whole time. He just didn't even stay in the seat. And I said, listen, if the game's still around at the end of the third quarter, I'll think about it. Do you know they came back and they won that game? Man, I wasn't leaving. But that's how I feel about coming to church. I'm not leaving Jesus. I'm not leaving the body of Christ. I don't care how cold it is or how lopsided it appears to be. In the name of Jesus, we have the victory. Amen. Amen. Be ye not conformed to the pattern of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You need to change your mindset. You judge before it's over. This game's a rout. There's no way they'll win. I can tell you that if I was on Route 1 driving home that day and found out that the Patriots tied it at the end of regulation and won it over time, I would have been torn. That's not the word I would use outside of church, but that's the word I use in church. I would have been twisted up angry. But see, that's how many of us experience our spiritual journey. It appears to be lopsided. Things are not going our way, and it's not convenient. We stop presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. We go, ah, this game's over. I'm done with this. On to the next week. Be ye not conformed to the pattern of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that, and once say so that. So that. So that you may prove, and once say prove. prove. You know what it means to prove? It needs to be able to show the truth of. 
you will be able to show the truth of that which is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In your life, when you present your body as a living sacrifice and stop living in the world and of the world, you have a measure of the fullness of the glory of God that is proven in your life. Amen. Isn't that good news? That's very good. Right? So we need to stop this being in the world and of the world. Now, we're going to talk about two fields. Sandy, next slide, please. Hey, anybody recognize that place? <laughs> Fenway. Fenway. All right. If you're not a sports fan, please forgive me today. This is just where God led me to talk about two fields. What do they play at Fenway? Baseball. Right. Now, baseball has a certain design. Bases are 90 feet apart. Right? They're measured out. The foul lines define what's fair play. Everything here. Anything over those green walls you see in the background. That's a home run automatically. You don't need to run hard. You just get to walk around the bases. You know, there are rules in this game that are played on this field. Yep. Right? This field is designed for a particular purpose. It has a purpose. It has rules that go with that purpose. All right? It has different setup than other fields. Different rules than other games, but it's a field nonetheless, right? With certain set of rules that follow in that field. Next slide. Hey, champion, the house of champions. Well, Tom Brady's in Florida now, but anyway. <laughs> What's this? It's a football field. Now, it's a game with its own rules. But the field is set differently for the purpose of the game. The purpose of the field being laid out. Now, in this field, there are rules that have to follow as well. Four downs, may 10 yards. If you don't, you turn the ball over. Three downs, if you don't, you can punt it away if you want to do that, etc., etc. Scoring is different than in baseball. Right? Scoring is different. Even a grand slam in baseball, the most runs you can score at one time is four. And in football, the touchdown's worth six. Now, everyone goes seven. No, you've got to make the extra point. Sorry, it's worth six. So, anyhow, there are rules on this field. Now, both fields are genuinely enjoyed by those that love sports and people that play them. Now, I didn't even take my favorite, which is a basketball court. But my sport to watch is football. Right? But when you're used to a certain level here of play, now I'm trying to take that same thing and conform it to Canadian football. I didn't think to put up a slide for this. It's just hitting me now. Canadian football fields are wider. They're longer, they have less downs to make their yardage. There's a whole bunch of different rules, though the genuine concept is the same. But if you try to take the Canadian football rules and impose it upon these people, it's going to mess up everything. Different fields, different purposes, different sets of rules, different players, different kinds of people that play the two different sports, although there are some that can do crossover. Right? Now, we're going to look a little different there. I'm going to get spiritual. Is that all right? We'll, we'll actually talk biblical for a bit. Is that going to be okay? Cindy, next slide, please. What's this, guys? Grapevine. Grapevine. Grapevines like that can be found in a, in a vineyard. All right. So we're going to look a little bit at the vineyard. Let's look at John chapter 15 for a moment. John chapter 15, we're going to look at verses 1 through 11. And we're going to see a little bit about the vineyard. Just by no means... Listen, I was trying to figure this out. Deb says to me that last night, I think, as we were finishing up our night, she's getting ready for bed. She goes, you know, Easter's just in two weeks, you know, or three weeks, whatever. Yeah, today's the fourth three weeks. And I said, I know, but I'm going to fit this in. So I was trying to figure out how many, how many weeks do I want to emphasize this? And, and do I stay with this for the next three weeks? Or do I, you know, anyway. So we're going to see where God brings us today, and then I'll determine what we're doing next week. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Let's read the word. We're going to look at the word. Now remember, different fields. Fields are set up differently and have different purposes according to what their needs, and not just their needs, but what their people are doing in those fields. John 15, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. 
Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now just take a moment and look at this. Now imagine that this first cluster of branches here didn't have those succulent, to me those look conquered grape, I'm not sure, but they didn't have those grapes. The vine dresser would come along with a pair of snips, garden snips, and cut those things to, for the purpose of making them to be fruitful. But if they don't bear fruit, you cut it all the way down. Because they're just taking up the energy that will produce the fruit in the rest. The Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Everyone say prune. That it may bear more fruit. You're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Funny thing, around the farm over there in Troy that Deb and I do that. If I take my snips and I cut off a branch from the apple tree, which I did a number of times in, in the past fall, and then with my tractor ran some branches off of the tree this year, and the branches fall to the ground, and guess what happens? They stop producing. If, if the branch doesn't abide, it stops producing the fruit. See, we think, we think, because we conform to the pattern of this world, I don't need to be in the body, I don't need to be in the vineyard, I'll still be fruitful. I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't work that way. If you get cut off, you might have some residue for a while that remains, but eventually it's going to die. Right? The vineyard. So we keep reading. <coughs> As the branch cannot, <coughs> excuse me. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine; you are the branches. Who's the vine? Right. So who do we think that we can be outside of him to be fruitful? He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Not catch, catch that word, please. Nothing. Not some things. Not even a few things. You can do nothing. Nothing of kingdom value. Nothing of eternal value. Oh, you can get along in the world. Trust me in this, you can. And people will think, what a great woman or what a great man that person is. But it doesn't have kingdom value because we're not abiding. If anyone doesn't abide in me, he's cast out as a branch. Listen, when we don't abide, God himself casts us out. Isn't that startling to you? Right? And is withered. So my tractor with my apple tree up on the front of the property, the tractor's got that eight foot roll bar that sits behind me in the seat, right? And I'm driving along, plowing because I got to get up to the driveways and get all this stuff done. And there's the apple tree stretched out all the way. And how am I going to get onto there? Well, I'm just going to go. <laughs> Bam. Snap, crack, branches fall to the ground. The branches, now it was already winter. So the, the, the fruit was gone and stuff. But those branches, now that the weather's warming, they're on the ground barren. That tree is still going to bud and be fruitful. Right? The branches are withered. They gather, they gather them and they throw them into the fire. They're burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so that you will be my disciples. So the Father is glorified. So many of us want to bring honor and glory to our own name. We want a title. We want a position. We want the notoriety. We want somebody to acknowledge my gift. No, none of that's the purpose for the placement of the vine or the branch. Jesus brings glory to the Father. We bring glory to the Father, not to ourselves. Jesus didn't bring glory to himself. He brought glory to his Father. That's, read it. It's in the scriptures, guys. Another message for another day. 
But so many of us are running around trying to make a name for ourselves. Who do we think we are? Like when you're part of the vineyard, pride, John the Baptist said it this way, less of me, more of him. Less of me, more of him. That's how you know where you're standing. Because if it's more of you, if it's all about you, you're still in the world and of the world. This shall be done for you by this, my Father is glorified, that you may bear much fruit, you will be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. So, in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, there are two significant reasons. <laughs> to be in the vineyard, the church, the body of Christ, whatever word you want to call it. The first one is pruning. Pruning is good for you. Do you know that God knows that there's stuff in your life that doesn't belong to him and he knows it needs to go? And we have an attachment to it. See, because in the vineyard still, these branches are grafted in, right? And it's hard. Like, have you ever tried to, instead of snip a branch, pull a branch off? It's a whole lot more work. And if you've ever been like me because you're stubborn in your mail, I'm just going to leave that on the table for you guys. If you're trying to unearth some stuff, if you don't have the right tools, what you want to do is you're, you're going to put on your gloves. You'll at least acknowledge that if I try to rip this root out of the ground and without gloves, my hand will get all marred up. And I'm going to put on gloves, and I'm going to prove that I'm capable of doing this. And so we try to get our hands and our footing, and my back's been hurting lately, and I can't bend over properly, but here, you know, you, you take this, and you get your gloves on, and you're trying to rip this thing out of the ground. And it snaps, and you fall to the ground, and the root still remains. <laughs> Just saying, it's, you know, so the pruning is because Jesus has told us in the Word that we've got to put the axe to the root. See, we're, we're so used to dealing with surface level issues. If I cut this branch on top side, guess what? That branch is going to grow again. We did it last spring. Phil, how hard did you work after we cut all that stuff down, right? I mean, all this stuff out here. And I noticed it in the fall, Phil. It was already coming back. But man, I'm going to probably have to drive my tractor eight miles and ten miles an hour. <laughs> being annoying like I am every time I'm behind one of those things. And come over here and, and, and get my back home and dig down and get the roots of these things out of here so that they don't grow back. Because we cut these things down. We cut them down so that the ground didn't look all overgrown and these thorny things went here. And there by the fall, psh, bushes were back up. I'm like, oh, man. You think I'd get this by now? I've been a property owner since 95. You know, I've lived on homes where we had to do this since I was a child. Now we just cut them down. Yeah, well, guess what? They're coming back. So when God cuts what needs to be cut, it's because he knows it's what's going to make us more fruitful. That's really annoying about this up here, thinking that that's going to be more fruitful than it was before we cut it down, because we cut it down, because it was annoying as it was. <sighs> How many of you know we all have stuff that's annoying? Oh, yeah. That needs to be cut off so that we'll be more fruitful in him, more fruitful in the things of the Spirit. Right? But when we're holding on to the things of the world, the things of the Spirit get crowded out. If I, if I did the, the parable of sowing and reaping, you cast your seed, rocky soil, thorny soil, birds of the air, all these things that take away the seed. So in, in, the, in the body, we get pruned. How many of you know that most of the reason we avoid the body is because we don't want to be pruned? We, don't, we just want to be who we are. This is just who God made me to be. No, this is your broken life, living out and manifesting. Yes, you may think you know Jesus, but I'm telling you, this isn't who God made you to be. This is who the world has caused you to be. Within the body, we can be pruned because others who are more mature can help us grow up in the things of God, and the Spirit of God can speak to us through worship, through prayer, through fellowship, through the Word, and through other human beings to help us to be more fruitful. So pruning is necessary, and so is abiding. We read it, I'm not going to belabor that point, but if we don't abide, 
there's no fruit. And, and even that which you think you have is going to be cast into the fire. So abiding. So the reason for the vineyard is for pruning. It's for abiding. There's some things that I'm not going to take time to talk about today. Discipleship doesn't happen in the world. Did you know that? Oh, it does. Let me correct myself. Discipleship happens in the world. You're just being discipled in the world. Not in the body of Christ. Not into he who's the head. Discipleship happens in the assembling of the saints. Small group, one-on-one -on -one relationships, all of those types of things are part of discipleship, right? Serving one another. There's a difference between serving the world and serving one another. And in the body of Christ, we're called to serve one another. Read the book of Acts. It says that they sold their possessions, gave to the poor as any had need, so that none had need. That was the one in others. There's still a service to the world, but the, the body of Christ... See, when the body of Christ doesn't do this part, guess who takes over? The federal government. How's that working for us? I mean, just think about where we are right now. The things are a mess. But that's because we stop serving one another and stop seeing that the body of Christ being connected to one another and meeting one another's need is supposed to happen as we grow up and mature in Christ so that God can be glorified. And then lastly, just for the conversation piece, two other things, giving happens within the body of Christ. Listen, there's no getting around it. I'm not going to apologize, but I'm also not going to obsess about it. Bring your tithe to the storehouse. That God may pour out blessings as he opens the floodgate of heaven. When we're not giving, we're not getting. We're not getting. And then lastly, there's a difference between loving those that are in the world, which was supposed to, because God loved the world, and loving one another. There's a difference in our relationship. Listen, we've talked about it even here. If it weren't for Jesus, many of us wouldn't be hanging out with each other. We're way too different, don't have enough in common, come from different places, our different ages, socioeconomic backgrounds, educational bents, all of that stuff. But Jesus causes us to love one another. And when you cut yourself off from the body, you don't love well. And you don't receive the same kind of love. Sharon can testify if I asked you right now, I know it, because she's been so missing being part of the body because she's been sick that you don't have that sin. Even though people have been reaching out and saying, there's nothing like being together with the saints. It's just nothing. We missed one week, you know, when we shut the church down because of sickness. And it did seem like forever. And Jeff said that very same Sunday when we opened last week. He said, well, not only did we miss the one week, but Thursdays have gone away. And then, and then I went, yeah, we hadn't met on Wednesdays for a month. And, and all of a sudden, we're just not able to connect and love one another. Because that's a different kind of love than what we get in the world. All of this in the vineyard. The church fits a function that's different than what the world fits. Right? So the world, next slide, Cindy, is our... Harvest field. In Luke chapter 10. Now remember, we're supposed to be in the world but not of the world. But the world is the harvest field. See, we, we look around now and we just get angry at what's happening in the world, forgetting that the world is the harvest. Like I used to be in the world. Thank God that somebody harvested me. Right? right? Like that was me. God knows that I had enough junk that people could have just ignored me and left me be, and I probably would, honest to God, no exaggeration, be dead. But somebody saw a stock, a single stock, Jeff Tibbetts, and said, he's ripe for harvest. His life is a mess, his emotions are a mess, everything about that boy is a mess. But, we're going to harvest him. So let me read Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through, I don't know how long I'll go, maybe all the way to 17. We'll see if I stop before then. Let me read it and talk about it. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. 
Then he said to them, the harvest truly is great. They would say the harvest is great. The harvest is great. But the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I'll send you out as lambs among wolves. Just think for a moment. I don't know a whole lot about wheat farming and things, but that stuff right there looks pretty ripe to me. Like if you let it go much longer, it's going to be lost. It's just going to turn into chaff. Poof. Somebody needs to go in. Now I know what we've done. So you got small churches, you got big churches. Before I had a tractor, much didn't get done. Now I got a tractor, I can do more. I understand how it works. Bigger churches can do more. But the small church still is called to the harvest field. If that's our property, we've still got to harvest that because it, that is a harvest that you don't want to be wasted. But we look around us and we think, my God, those people are a mess. I wouldn't want them in my church. And if you think I'm exaggerating, I can tell you, and I won't use names, God's honest truth, though, here in this region of New Hampshire, I won't even say which city, of one church who said, oh, you need to go to that church because they don't have that kind of people in this church. God's honest truth, I'm not even exaggerating that. My first church, I'm going to tell you a true story from my first church. My first church, we took 16 people, and I've told that part of the story before, 12 of which were over the age of 65 when I started. 16 people my first Sunday. And we, no Sunday school, no youth group, nothing going on in the church. We started to grow the church. Added the Sunday school, added the youth group, increased. Went from being only able to meet in the fellowship hall because that's all they could afford to eat, not sitting in the sanctuary, to by the second winter we were there, being able to afford to sit in the sanctuary. But we also started a food pantry, a clothing ministry, and outreach. Because I lived in a socioeconomic repressed community. And so this is why I heard from some of the people that were long-timers that were there at the church and had money, and they said, oh, sure, he's bringing people in, but look, they all have needs. Oh, my, I think Jesus said, I didn't come for the righteous, but I came for those in need of a physician. But see, but see how what happens when we conform to the world? We want people that who you know minimally make a hundred thousand dollars a year, or you know can afford to dress like us, or you know have 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 the same level of attainment of education as us, or whatever. Like I can literally tell you story after story after story of how this is manifest in churches, because we stop remembering that it is about the harvest field. See, the vineyard exists to raise up people to go into that, the harvest field. People, if we don't go into the harvest field, this harvest dies. And in the sake of the kingdom, those that die outside of the vineyard, they go to hell. It's, it's lost not only in this life, but for all of eternity. Torment until the end of time. Isn't that amazing? Like, we've got to remember that, right? So, <clears throat> let me go back to read it. Pray that the Lord would send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, sandals, and greet no one along the road. Quick aside from this, don't let the things of the world detract you from the purpose of reaching the harvest. Stop taking the things of this world, conforming to the, the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God said, I'll meet your every need according to my riches and glory. Stop thinking you need to take the world with you. Amen. But see, if you're outside of the body, you don't learn that. So you're trying to do it outside there with all the things of the world and the people in the world go, you look and sound just like me. Why do I need Jesus? Because you're worldly. And they go, well, I'm already there. So I don't need what you're offering. Because I'm conform to the world and the pattern hereof. And I don't look different. I don't sound different. I don't taste different. By that, salt and light. Salt has a, pecu a peculiar taste. One of the first Sundays, there's another that I was serving in a church that this guy was a visitor. He, he and his wife had come a couple of times now, and he came up to me one after, uh, after service on Sunday, and he kind of hugged on my neck, and he, and he did this literally in my shoulder, in my ear, and he went... 
And I was like, okay. And, and he says this, he goes, you smell like a sheep. Now I barely knew this guy, and I'm like, huh? Because I never heard this expression before. I didn't know what he meant. I thought it was like, I had not showered for a month? I'd be like, what? Like, what do you mean I smell like a sheep? Because my whole church was in downtown Worcester. We had people that smelled like the street. I knew what that was. That wasn't good. Yeah. Urine and, you know, yeah. that, that whole stuff. Yeah. You smell like a sheep. Oh, man. It kind of creeped me out for a moment. I'm like, what's he saying? That's a good feeling. You smell like a sheep. My sheep know my voice. And so he was complimenting me, but I didn't get it at first. But see, we have, we should have a certain aroma. We should have a certain flavor. We should have a certain appearance. And I don't mean like the way you dress. I, brother, come up for a minute. Listen, you guys have seen me. I've come up here on Sundays looking just like this. I don't care if you dress like Jeff leading worship or Jeff dress like me. I don't care what that looks like. I'm just saying that see, people ought to be able to see a little bit of Jesus in us. Don't you think? Yeah. They ought to see Jesus. And I love my brother. And I, and I see Jesus in him. And so I'm grateful for him. And it doesn't matter that we're not dressed the same today. Because we're dressed in robes of righteousness that has nothing to do with this world. Yes, right. And so we've got to Stop remembering when people come in, they're the harvest. Stop making superficial judgments about like how they dress. Or if I can dare to say this, even how they smell. Because mm -hmm. we had homeless people come into my downtown, inner city, large Worcester church that had food pantries and, and, and literally the people so shunned these folks that they literally left the church. Because they didn't fit our vision of what the harvest is supposed to look like. But Jesus was bringing them to the doors of the church. Now we've got to remember it's about the harvest. Right? Carry you the money bag, knapsack, sandals, greet no one along the road, but whatever house you enter first, say peace to it. Now I want you to see something about that. Whatever house you enter. See, we forget that the harvest, we're waiting for the harvest to come in here. The harvest field is a field out there. We go into the harvest field. Stop thinking that it's going to just happen, that those that are on the stocks are going to come walking on in. Because that doesn't happen. I mean, it happens, but that's not the normal way. The effective way. You can do addition. You know, one person a year, two people maybe. But multiplication. Read the scripture. Things exploded when the church behaved like the church was supposed to. Thousands added daily. God added to their number daily, those that were being saved. No one dared join them, and yet many became believers. I mean, all of the things you read in Scripture, man, we've got to stop thinking that it's somehow about us. We come here into the vineyard. This is our training ground. We learn how to war here. We learn how to dress for battle. We learn how to carry the equipment that we're supposed to carry to go into the harvest field. When I got my Kubota tractor, boy, did it change some things for me. And I can't tell you, already Deb started to talk to me, have you seen the driveway? Have you seen the lot? There's a lot of work for you to do. And I go, there is. And she goes, well, you're going to love it because you'll be on your toy. And I went, yes, I will. So there's all kinds of stuff that need to be done. But having that mindset, I've got a tractor now. Oh, it's not going to be so bad pulling rocks out of the ground in my driveway that can help bottom out cars, you know, fixing walls and all that crazy stuff. We get equipped here so that we can go there. Right? That's where we, that's the, that's the target. This isn't the target. This is the training ground. The target is to go back out with the gospel of Jesus to, to reap What's been shown? All right. Peace, whatever house you enter, say to it first. I mean, first say, peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on you. If not, it will return to you. Now listen, it doesn't say stay where you're unwelcome. It doesn't say that. You don't need to beat your head against a wall. And that's where we get stuck. Well, I tried that, Pastor. That doesn't work. No, you tried it once. Move on to the next place. Try it again. Like, just think about, like, in the, in the world for a moment, I can't remember which one of the inventors, I think it was Edison, if I'm not mistaken, someone that is more historically bent can, can correct me on this, I think Edison had over a thousand failures 
before he invited, invented the light bulb. Right? So imagine if he went 499, ah, oh, stick it, I'm done. Imagine in 999, I tried and I tried and I tried, but he knew that there was a there was a, 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 a reward, if you will, to just to use some biblical language. There was there was something that was so important about this that he had to persevere until he found that which caused this to come to pass. Man, souls are so much more valuable than electricity and lights, and, and we forget because we've become so accustomed to our creature comforts. Right? That's why I love mission trips and friends that serve on the field, pastors that I've known. Talk to my friend from India who said to me, people during monsoon season walk two to three days in the rain over mountains to get to the house of worship. Now, if you've walked two or three days in the monsoon, A, it can't be comfortable, and B, you've now got two or three days back in monsoon to turn around literally one or two days after you get home to turn back to go two or three days again over the mountains in the monsoon to come back to the house and they do it. And in America, if I gotta put a coat on, I'm not sure I wanna go out, it's a little chilly today. <laughs> it's easier to pull the, it's e the, the wussification of the American church is a real thing. It's easier to pull the covers up and just stay in bed. And we find excuse not to rather than somehow to. Because if you're determined enough, you will find the somehow. But we become lazy. All right. You still love me? Yes. All right, just making sure. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give for the laborers worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house, right? So God doesn't want you scatter shooting all of this. He wants you to find a, a fruitful harvest and, and reap that harvest. Cultivate that. You know, make sure that that comes to fruition. Okay, so it's good. You've, you've evaluated it. Hey, look, that's going to possibly be good fruit, but I'm going to go on to the next thing. No, make sure that they get there. Stay with the one. This is part of the discipleship process that happens in the house that then equips you to go out to do this in the world. All right. And heal the sick <clears throat> and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever, you, whatever city you enter and they don't receive you, Go into the streets and say, the very dust of your city which clings to us we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near to you. Our pronouncements the same whether they receive us or not. Stop, like, cursing. Because they don't receive. Just make the same pronouncement. It's the same pronouncement. The kingdom of God has come near to you today. The decision's theirs. The labor is ours. Just do the work of the laborer. Right? But I say to you, it will be more, um, in my, my Bible's it puts as a desirable, I think, in the day for Sodom and Gomorrah than for that city. All right, so we're going to end there for a moment. I want you to see the, the work in the harvest field. Right? We looked at the vineyard, what takes place here, discipleship and loving and serving one another, giving, pruning, abiding, all of that. So in the harvest field, before this ever is ready to be harvested, someone's got to cultivate the soil. You, you, you're probably going to have to turn it over, rototill it, dig a shovel into it, whatever it is. Listen, when you get the right tool, it's much easier. I was just thinking about this morning. I think I'm going back up to Walpole in the next couple of weeks. And I'm going to buy an attachment for my tractor because we've got a lot of property that will literally turn that soil because there's a lot of soil that needs to be turned in. Man, the, 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 the walk behind rototill that we have is a pain in the butt. It's heavy, it's antiquated, it doesn't always stop. We, we, we pull the ripcord out, it's going to be replaced. And then, and then, you got to go over two or three times at a time. You betcha. All right, $2,700, I think you said what they told me. Yep, I'm going to find it because I want to be able to accomplish it. I'll be motivated. 
Because I've got to then not only cultivate the soil, what am I going to do next? I'm going to plant some seed. If you don't cultivate the soil, you got to plant some seed. If you don't cultivate it, the seed could be plucked up by the birds. Or the rocks. Or the thorns. Yeah. Right? So you got to cultivate it. you got to plant. Right? you got to do some sowing. And what that means is, in, in the natural here, that we're talking about seed. But I'm talking about, like, you got to invest in people's lives. That's hard work. It's time consuming. And, and, it's, and it, it exacts something from you. And, and listen, present your body as a living sacrifice. Man, that's... There's a cost associated with this. But, but the reward, if I can use that, is worth it. I have literally found no greater joy in this life than leading a soul to Jesus. But we're losing sight of the field for the sake of the fellowship. The fellowship is sweet, and it, and it makes my heart glad, but it doesn't bring me the same joy, and it doesn't cause heaven to rejoice in the same way. So we, we, we plant, we cultivate, we sow, you know, we invest in others, and then after a due season, you get to reap what you've sown. That happens there. It doesn't happen here. It happens in the field. The reaping happens in the field. Now again, God might bring somebody into church. There might be an occasion that someone comes that doesn't know Jesus, and they come to know Jesus, and we can be thankful, but it's not the same as our own labor that gives us our own gladness for the reward. Our serving in the world looks a little different. So in Acts chapter 6, I'm not going to take the time to go there, but we know that there was the issue with the feeding of the widows. And, and there were some complaints that the Jews and the Hellenists had against one another. And so it says in Acts chapter 6, find seven men full of the Holy Spirit and of good reputation. See, so even in the world they were saying, listen, fill them with the Spirit, but also make sure they've got a good reputation out there so that people can say, hey, they're, they're not showing favorites. And charge them with the task of the distribution of bread. As for us, we're going to devote ourselves to prayer and to the preaching of the Word. See, because in the vineyard, that's what you do. And even in the field, there are people that are meant to preach. But some of us have got to just serve. We've got to be hands and feet of Jesus. But it just looks different than it does among the serve one another. Now we're serving literally. That's how Jesus came. Do you ever read the Gospels just to see what Jesus did? He met the needs of the people. Physical healing, food, I mean, all kinds of different things. He met the needs of the people. Then he told them about the kingdom with the way with which he met the need. The kingdom of God is like, I mean, how many times does it say that in Scripture? He's making a parable so that they can have understanding, so that they can enter the kingdom. But he did it as he met their needs. So we've got to be able to serve, because literally if you read Acts chapter 6, and I read it again just quickly this morning, it was after they served that they evangelized. It was after they served that they evangelized. And we want to know, not that, that evangelism without service doesn't work, it does, but we want to know why our evangelism without service isn't working as well. Because except for the period of the Jesus movement, when all you had to do was like breathe in the atmosphere of any of the young people that were coming to Jesus, just say the name of Jesus, and people were like falling out, like, yes, I want him! Like, other than that, there's not a whole lot of the history that I've read that isn't attached. Hey, you know how hospitals were started? By the church, serving the sick. That's literally how hospitals came about. Right? I mean, and on and on we could go with some of this. We serve so that we can tell people about Jesus because we want them to come to the knowledge of who he is. And we do love. And how do we love in the world? It's a little different than it is in the church. You lay down your life just like Jesus laid his life down. You know that annoying co-worker that you absolutely cannot stand that's in the station next to you 
who's coddling on the fritz this week and who needs a ride and whose house you go by every day. I'm going to tell you a true story because nobody's here and I'm not going to tell who and I'm not going to tell from where, where it was. But we had a person in mine and Deb's time here that wanted to come to church here that lived in a neighboring town that nobody would pick up. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Just one? I mean, like, yeah. I know some of us are probably struggling, but, but that's, that's a reality. Because it, it, it might take me out of my way, or I might, I might have feelings about, would you lay down your life? While you were yet an enemy of God, Christ laid down his life for you to make known the love of God for you. In the field, it shouldn't matter how we feel about them. Because if we're concerning ourselves about how we feel about them, we're focused on the world and not on the God that we serve. We've got to get back to concerning ourselves with the God who died for me. I get to still live. I might have to go out of my way and pick somebody up that I don't really want to. Maybe I don't like them. Maybe they smell funny. Sorry. <laughs> but I'm thinking that there are occasions where the fragrance of my life is less than desirable to the Lord, and yet he loved me enough to die for me. Because it's about the harvest. And so she, Sandy, next slide. No, there you go. No, just the, Sorry, so lightly. There you go. Does anybody recognize what this is? Yeah, okay, it's a football game. That's as much as you recognize. Anybody else recognize a little more detail? It's the Patriots at Fenway Park when they were the Boston Patriots back in the 60s. So you've got a different game being played on the baseball field because there's enough overlap that they could set up the field so that they could do this. So what I want to say is that some of the things that happen in the church do happen in the harvest as well. The vineyard and the harvest field are not mutually exclusive. There is some overlap, even though they're distinctly different in how they're set up and what they're purposed for. There are some things that take place. So some of the things that we glean or get here in the church are things that we also have in the world and some of the things that we can learn from others. One of the most important things that I think we need to probably do, and by we I mean me and maybe one or two of you need to come with me, we need to take our video camera and do a man on the street interview and just ask people, like what would it take for you to even consider church? Like not even come, just to consider it. And hear what they have to say so that we might be able to set up some strategies prayerfully to consider how can we effectively reach the harvest field. Because the world in that way, now I'm not talking about, you know, and I'm, please forgive me, this is not meant to be in any way heretical or disrespectful. No, we're never going to set up a strip club here on the altar. It's just not happening. I don't mean that because I don't want the world that way infringing. But we can learn some things. Cross-pollination is probably a good thing. There are things that, you know, we can learn in terms of processes that the business world has been 50 years ahead of us in to make us more effective in what we do. You can play some football on the baseball field. Now, funny thing is they haven't done that, you know, in years. Although I did find some pictures of Notre Dame playing it, by the way. I was like, Notre Dame, not even Boston College? That was weird. Literally, it was Notre Dame's home field on Fenway. That was in the 80s. It's like, hmm, okay. So it's not that this still happens a lot, but guys, we've got to figure out how we take what is in the vineyard and make it known to the world so that those are in the world that, that, that they can become part of the vineyard. Does that make some sense? Mm -hmm. Like, we've got to figure out what's it going to take because the world is encroaching in people's lives, and the vineyard is losing its fruitfulness. So we've got to do something different. Recognizing what our field's purpose is for. Because as you guys know, I love you dearly. 
and I'm so grateful that we get to pastor you. And I love being with you. But we can't think it's only about us. It's about the harvest. And we've got to reorient our thinking. So I'm going to walk you through the banners. That's why I put them up early. Deb's like, you going to put them up? I'm like, yeah, I guess I can. I wasn't really thinking I was going to too, too far ahead of Easter. We've got a few weeks. Hey, when everything's good and things are popular, praise and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna! Yes, Jesus! <laughs> we walk through some, <coughs> some stuff and Jesus comes to what we call Monday, Thursday, Holy Thursday. And he starts talking strangely about eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood. And, and then we get confused. Like, Lord, I'm, no, you can't die. What are you talking about? This isn't going to, no, this can't be. Jesus said, yeah, it is. This is, this is what I came for. I came to die so that you could live. I read a meme just this week, I think. I'm never going to remember the language, but it was a great meme. The crowd didn't call for Barabbas because they liked Barabbas. No. They hated Jesus. So the same crowd, now, not that everybody, but in the same crowd, all of the same crowd that was there for the Passover, that was shouting as he came in, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, were found together on Friday, saying, crucify him. Give us Barabbas. He's less threatening. He's less demanding. I don't have to die. Give us Barabbas. Now, like, I, I think about it, because we talk about it, the banner says, it is finished, and, and, and that's a great expression in, from the cross, but the one that really strikes me is, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, we, we think about all of that in, in light of what I just said. The very people that were shouting, give us Barabbas, forgive them. For the very people that were hating on Jesus, Jesus said, forgive them. Like, we can't get past the give us Barabbas. Crucify him. And so we don't even think to forgive him. But the work of Calvary was the work that he came to accomplish because there was a harvest field that needed a savior. We'll save Easter for later. Sunday morning is coming, church. Sunday morning is coming. And I don't just need another week here. I need Sunday morning is coming. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. See, right now, we think the wall, the stone is still in front of the tomb. Now, I don't mean historically. We, we, we know that, you know, historically, Jesus rose from the dead. But because of the circumstances of the world and all that's going on around us and the condition of the harvest, we think... He must be dead. And I know that nobody here would confess that, but the way we live, the emotion that we choose to exhibit, the, 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 the lack of faith that we have to, to move into the promises of God in spite of what we see and hear, we're living as if Jesus is not alive. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Soon and very soon. Now, you guys remember this one? In the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, right? In the morning, when I rise, give me Jesus. I forgive me, I'm not Fernando for Ortega. I don't sing like he does. Oh, you do pretty good though. But we need Jesus, right? But more than just us, the world needs Jesus. People rise up every morning with no hope and live with despair. They don't even know that what they're actually saying is, Lord, would you give me Jesus? 
And when I come to die, and when I come to die, when I come to die, give me Jesus. Do you know our only plea is Jesus? He's our only plea. He's the answer to all that ails us. We just happen to know it because now we're here and we get reminded and we're in this vineyard. But there are people who would think that they call themselves by the name of Jesus and they don't remember even. He's our only plea. There's a sin, sick, and dying world out there, guys. Easter's coming quickly. We have the most incredible, life-changing, world-changing. They changed the calendar because of Jesus. We've got the news that would shatter the darkness of the world that is around us. His name is Jesus. Let us remember as we go forth from that, this place today. We are sent into the harvest field. Amen? Amen. I told you, no emotional pull today, just all truth. Is that all right? Yeah. But here's what I want to say. If there's anybody that needs prayer, we're available for prayer. Always there's availability of prayer. Don't leave if you need prayer today without letting us pray with you. 